violence in the English city of Bradford in April as rival groups of demonstrators clashed over the issue of race. One policeman needed 15 stitches and a head wound and over 30 demonstrators were arrested during a march by the National Front, an extreme right-wing party which demands an end to coloured immigration and the repatriation of coloured people. On the same day, the party staged another rally in London, which ended in similar disorder. The demonstrations and political events since then have forced the question of immigration once more to the forefront of public attention in Britain. There are slightly fewer than two million coloured immigrants in Britain, but although they account for just over 3% of the total population, they are concentrated in relatively small areas, principally in the poorer districts of large industrial cities. Racial tensions between these communities and the white population do exist, but it's been generally accepted until now that the immigration laws restricting the numbers coming into the country were sufficient to prevent widespread racial friction. This assumption has now been called into question following a leak of a confidential government report called the Hawley Report, which stated that the number of dependents of Indian, Pakistani and Bangladesh immigrants waiting to come to Britain was virtually infinite, and that widespread abuses of the law ensured that many immigrants were entering Britain illegally. Until 1962, any citizen of Britain's colonies was free to leave his own country and settle in Britain. Some of these colonies contained substantial minorities, like the Asian communities in East Africa. And as the colonies gained independence, these minorities were given the choice of local or British citizenship. In Africa, many Asians chose to keep their British passports. And when Africanization robbed them of their jobs, they demanded and were allowed to come to Britain. To ensure that the flow of immigrants didn't outstrip Britain's ability to absorb them, a voucher scheme was introduced that allowed in 5,000 families a year. This scheme, enshrined in the 1971 Immigration Act, still accounts for 20,000 immigrants a year and another 40,000 Asians are still waiting their turn in the queue. The other main source of immigration into Britain is from the pool of dependents of those immigrants who settled in Britain before the 1971 Act came into force. And it's questions about the number of those dependents that's behind the present controversy over the Hawley Report. The report says the concession to allow fiancés of settled immigrants to enter Britain entails a growing queue of their dependents. These revelations have fueled the arguments of Mr Enoch Powell, a member of Parliament who's long made dire warnings about the future of race relations in Britain. The point is that we are creating, indeed we have already created and we are constantly augmenting in our great cities exactly, classically, that situation in which the injection of unmotivated violence uh, not uh, murder for robbery or revenge or anything of that sort, but unmotivated violence, violence specifically directed to produce these consequences, uh, will have uh, an escalating effect, have a sort of nuclear effect. Uh, you see this wherever there is uh, a divided community with a majority and a minority, for everyone immediately says, oh, well, this must be because the minority is being unjustly treated. In fact, in this country, the immigrant minority is not, not only not being unjustly treated, but they are being treated with a lavish concern, which no minority would enjoy in any other country in the world, so much so, as Mr. Hawley said in his report, they can't think what's wrong with our heads. The way, the, the, way we, the way we carry on. But then uh, people say, there wouldn't have been this violence if we weren't doing something wrong, so they immediately try to find out what it is that they were doing wrong to make up for it. The result of that is simply to put more power, more leverage in the hands of those who are operating the violence. And so it goes on until there is very natural. Uh, the technical term is a backlash. You have a backlash, and of course it would be called a white backlash. And so on one side and the other, you have what uh, um, uh, eventually erupts 
into a form of civil war. And we are. If we were asked to create the conditions for civil war, we couldn't do better than what we have been achieving uh, and are continuing to accumulate in some of the major cities and industrial areas of this country. Could, you, could I ask you about... But Mr. Powell and the report's author, Donald Hawley, have not gone unchallenged. This man, Alex Lyon, was until recently a Home Office Minister in charge of immigration. He maintains there is a finite number of dependents and that Mr. Hawley's got his sums wrong. What I'm saying is that he paid too much attention to wild allegations about the threat that is posed by the fact which is undeniable that a great many people in India, Pakistan and Bangladesh want to come to this country. That's quite a, a long step from saying that they actually will get into this country because most of them have no right to come and most of them would never get past the gate of the High Commission because they can't put forward any serious claim to come. No, I, I say 100,000 in wives and children from the Indian subcontinent, about 40,000 uh, East African nations from East Africa. Well, how do you know? How do I know? Well, the estimate has been made in relation to the East African nations on the basis of the passports which have been issued in those countries, and that estimate is accepted as being fairly reliable. But what about the other 100,000? The 100,000 is deducible by taking the number of men who came into this country from India, Pakistan and Bangladesh before uh, 1973 and deducting from it the number of families who've been admitted since then. Now that by its nature and because of the way in which immigration statistics are kept could not be anything like as reliable as the 40,000. Mm. Nonetheless, it's the best estimate that officials have been able to produce. And I stress it's not my estimate, it's officials. Uh, over the years, and it, it accords with all we know about the position in the subcontinent. Was it because of the... One charge in the report is that many of the immigrants who come into Britain do so on false documents, and that an established industry exists in India and Bangladesh to provide illegal immigrants with all the fake papers they need to gain entry. It also mentions wives acting as couriers for more than one batch of children and bogus teenage children being introduced on applications for admission as dependents. The report also says that entitled dependents might include second or third wives, especially in the case of Muslims. But these allegations have been received sceptically by some leaders of Britain's immigrant communities. We asked Mr. Rai of the Indian Workers' Association how many immigrants he thought with came in papers. illegally. I don't think any immigrant has come with the false papers from the British High Commission because they screen very deeply before they can give the entry certificate. So what, do, do, do you think the whole report is exaggerated then? Or what? It is very much exaggerated. Why would that be? Why would they? Uh, I think uh, this is very unfortunate uh, that uh, there are officials in the foreign office and home office which are racially prejudiced or have got out of date thinking about uh, uh, immigrants. That's quite, a, quite a, um, uh, an accusation that, that it's pure prejudice that has brought out this report. This is a really a prejudice report. You're, you're, you're quite convinced in your own mind that it's only a very small proportion of, of, of cases that are bogus. Oh, oh yes, yes, I'm more, more than, than that convinced, convinced because, because I know, know the whole situation better than the people who have produced the reports. That it's a very insignificant uh, proportion or number of people who produce false documentation. Thank you very much. There is also the question of a trade in passports. This is not mentioned in the report as a serious or frequently practiced illegality, but it's possible in Britain to report a passport as lost and have it replaced. Mr. Raj Kumar, an Indian, claims he's lost no fewer than five passports since he came to Britain. When you applied for new passports all the time, was there not suspicion that, that here you are, Raj Kumar, for the fifth time in 10 years or 12 years, was there no suspicion? No, they told me. 
They told me last time that we will not issue you a new passport. So what happened then? But they issued me the passport and they told me we will not issue you anymore if you lose this. And I have lost. Even with that warning, you still lost your passport? I mean, people don't, people don't lose their passport, do they? It's not the sort of thing, I mean, it's, it's one of the most treasured things somebody's got, but you've lost it five times. Yeah, but I've lost five, five passports in 18 years. Not but in one year, no, but in that's, 18 years. That's still quite a lot, isn't it? I mean, people have the same passport, most people keep one passport all their, all their lives. Are you not open to suspicion? Well, yes, it does. They can be suspicious that I'm maybe uh, I'm selling them the way you're suggesting it is. It fetches the price. Could be. Have you ever heard anything about a possible traffic in passports back to India, British passports? No. Have you ever sold your passport for money? No. Have you ever been asked to? No. But is it not true that the carelessness with which you have treated your passports would lead people to believe? that you have been selling your passports to people in, in India or elsewhere to come into this country on forged passports. Is that not a fair assumption? Well, they can think. Definitely they will think that way, if they want to think. But is it true? They just cannot just uh, assume things, can they, until unless they have got two and two things to put together. But is it true? That you no, how can it be true? Well, it can be true very easily because yeah. you've lost so many. Well, uh, it's not an offence to lose a passport. I've just lost. I might lose my life. I'm a very careless person. I'm simply a very careless person. Immigrants from Malawi sparked off another racial controversy. A mere handful of Malawians with UK passports was enough to provoke the extremists. Last time the National Front hotted up their campaign against immigrants, it was over the 26,000 from Uganda. This time they campaigned just as strongly against only 38 Asians. The British people did not fight two world wars to have you take over their country. Go home. The National Front say stop immigration now. Stop repatriation and give us our country back. The first families were clearly embarrassed by the attention they received. But one group became the centre of a storm when their story became public. They were housed in four-star luxury by the West Sussex County Council, who found themselves responsible for providing temporary accommodation for any homeless immigrants landing at nearby Gatwick Airport. The Suleiman family had obviously had a tough time in Malawi. Officials of Dr Hastings' Banda intent on Africanizing the country, had pressured the Suleimans, and they finally abandoned their grocery business when relatives offered to pay their fare to the safety of Britain. There was another good reason to come to Britain. The head of the family, Adam, needs an operation they couldn't afford in their own country. Most Englishmen didn't grudge the Suleimans a roof over their heads or medical aid but many were upset at the price, 35,000 pounds, because the only housing the council could provide was a top-class hotel. Next stop for the Suleimans was this hostel, cheaper, more Spartan and more appropriate than the airport hotel. Here at Bajna Lodge, the cost of keeping a family of four was a more reasonable 25 pounds a week. It's normally used as temporary accommodation for families waiting for permanent homes from the council, families who weren't at all pleased to see the Asians. A quietly hostile reception awaited the Suleimans and another group of new arrivals from Malawi. The protest was by young couples who were claiming that the council gave unfair preference to housing immigrants before others on the housing waiting lists. Because I've been waiting here 13 months for welfare house, and you get the Asians coming in, and then within a matter of weeks they're gone again. They got a house. You scared? You're scared they're going to jump the queue, are you? Well, they will jump the queue. I know they will. Well, I disagree with it. Them coming in. I've been waiting now three years, coming up for now. I've been on the council. The council have mucked me around. 
but they're coming in and they are taking up the houses. They're only here for a few weeks. But the council do say that there, were, that there won't be any no, queue jumping. No, that's rubbish. They are jumping the queue. I know that for a fact. I've seen 24 families come and go since I've been here. Asian families? Yeah, it's all coloured families. They've been transported from their country over here. Oh, no, it's not true, the council said. It's the last lot that moved out, they've only been here two months, in the country. And they're going into a welfare house now. There's people been waiting to dance so long. How long have you been waiting? I've only been here two and a half months. But we're lucky we've got our problems solved. It's unfair for the people who have been waiting, you know, for so long that uh, these Asians can come over and get houses within a matter of time. But we have, I mean, you know, you have been given assurances, haven't you, that this won't happen? Well, we, we've heard the council, they've gone on record as saying that it, does, it never involves queue jumping. Oh, well, that's what they say. I mean, you have to come here to get the actual facts. I mean, we've seen families come and go inside a matter of weeks. They've got houses. I mean, it's just not fair. How long have you been waiting? Five months. Have you got fa family children? Yes, I've got five children. Yes, yes, five children. And how much longer do you expect to have to wait? Well, uh, there's no telling, really. I mean, it could be one month, it could be one year, it could be two years. I mean, you know, there's just no telling. Because these Asian families are coming in and they're definitely queue jumping. They're definitely getting houses before the white families, you know? Because they've got to move the families out of here to make room for the ones that are flying in from Gatwick. Heathrow Airport is, in fact, the gateway to Britain for most immigrant families. Here, it's the responsibility of Hillingdon Council to help new arrivals. They man a round-the-clock service to receive homeless or needy newcomers to find accommodation, transport and funds. But it could be a heavy burden in future for Hillingdon, for some 6,000 Malawi Asians with British passports could turn up here, demanding a home like this and to be clothed and fed, all at the expense of Hillingdon's ratepayers. At the prospect of paying large sums to strangers, it's hardly surprising that many people in Hillingdon are calling on central government to foot the bill for these immigrants. One man who takes that view is Councillor T.P. Dix. Well, what, what is the solution then? I mean, people are going to continue arriving, aren't they? Exactly. There's two ways, as I see it, of coping with it. First of all, you literally leave them at the airport. And if they're left there long enough, the government will step in and provide the facilities it ought to provide. If it thinks, it ought to let them in. That's the first thing. The second thing is, you turn them back. You know, these are, these are easy decisions, which is what our council does, and they're difficult decisions, which is the one I'm advocating. It's not an easy one. It must be done for the good of the population of Hillingdon and the population of this country as a whole. But if the council has properties like these ones here at their disposal, that they can happily put these Asians into, you're surely not saying that they should ignore that and just send these people back? No, I'm saying there are more people they could find to go into these houses rather than Asians. There's a massive cover-up going on between the council and the... Home Office to ensure that people of this country don't know how many are coming in and don't know what facilities we're providing for these people. Their housing facilities, education facilities, welfare facilities, all of these add up to one tremendous bill to the people of this country and in the local circumstance to the people of Hillingdon. And I'm totally opposed to us having to meet that bill. Most immigrant families eventually gravitate to an area like this. Usually they are down at heel suburbs or poor inner city zones where Asians have taken over a corner shop or restaurant and invited their relatives to join them. Generally, Indians and Pakistanis keep to themselves, but when the spread of their tightly knit communities threatens to infringe on a white area, there can be trouble. One way the British government has tried to control it is through race relations legislation which effectively outlaws discrimination on the grounds of race or colour. For instance, employers can't specify colour when they advertise job vacancies. One man who's just defied the law is Robert Ralph, a member of the National Front, who advertised his house as for sale only to an English family. He was jailed when he refused a judge's order to remove the for sale sign and began a hunger strike in prison. Ralph's wife, Sadie, said he was unrepentant. And Enoch Powell said our streets will run with blood. Well, this is going to happen. When they carry my husband's body out that bleeding jail, you're going to see it. It's absolutely it. fantastic. Any blicking sense about it at all, I can't see. They know he's going to die. He's not the man to back down. 
But isn't it true you'd rather have him in jail and see a better figurehead for the National Front in jail than out of jail? Would you like your wife in jail? I don't want you in jail. I wish I could pick him up and take him away right now. I would. What did you think about his state of health when he saw him in court today? He's ill. Definitely ill. He's having a job to stand up. He's that type of man. His mind is keeping him up on his feet. But are you now concerned that there may be trouble at the demonstration on uh, Saturday outside Stafford Jail? Well, can we consider they're asking for it? They've asked for this from start to finish. It's a very simple action that your husband has to take, Mrs. Ralph. That's to take down the sign. What should back he back down? down? Is that simple this is to his you? Country. The judge made the point that he's breaking the law. He said it's as simple as that. Whose law? Not our law. It's the law which exists. And I it's think not that's our the law. This is a law that was made specially for the people who came into our country. It's not the Englishman's law. It's not our law. Would you back down if you felt strongly about something? No man who's worth his salt would. When Ralph was moved to Winston Green Prison in Birmingham, there was trouble. The police made a concerted charge and clashed with a counter-demonstration by left-wingers, among them many Negroes and Asians. It was not the National Front who started the fighting, but a thousand communist and black power supporters who tried to smash through the police lines. After the charge to break up the demonstrators, nine policemen were injured, some hit by flying stones and bottles. Among the protesters, 28 arrests were made, while the unpopular National Front continued its peaceful demonstration over the rebel Ralph. Scenes like this are uncommon in Britain. The militancy of the National Front and the recent words of Enoch Powell worry some immigrants though others are still placing their confidence in the tolerance of the great majority of Britons. My cousin was in England when I was about 16 years. So he wrote a lot of letters. It's a nice country and he earning a lot of money. So it made me to come here. Did your wife follow you afterwards? Yes, uh, after um, six years. What happens now with your children? Will they marry in this country? They will, yes. Uh, will they marry people from this country, or do you think they might want people from uh, Punjab to come here? Well, I think uh, they will marry here. I like if they marry here. Good. What about Mr. Powell and the things he's been saying? What do you think about that? Well, sometimes when I read a paper, he upset me. Then I think uh, I'm not OK here. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Sometimes I think uh, if I buy a property here or if I spend all my money in this country, may I in trouble in after a few years. Do you think that he upsets a lot of people here? A lot of people, I think. What do you think about Mr. Powell's statement last night? Well, when I heard it, um, I was very much appalled and I felt quite bitter, despondent and angry. And I thought it was sort of a speech that he made was very dangerous um, in this country and for the black community and the race relations as a whole. He talked about race relations being so bad it could lead to violence. What, what do you think of that? Yes, yeah, so you have noted this because he introduces a new factor, a factor he, which he calls the injection of firearm and violence in the society and he says that if it doesn't happen tomorrow it will happen. Now I think that's also a very ominous and also extremely dangerous kind of talk. Um, that is, I think, uh, that tend amounts to incitement and starting of racial conflict and violence. The question is, what can you do about it? Well, I think that um, well, there is a ray of hope because we believe that in this country there are decent-minded people and people will really not get swayed by this kind of emotive speeches that Enoch Powell makes. People will really look at 
things objectively and in the right, right kind of perspective, not at really exaggerating facts like Inakpal and others seem to do, but really look at it in a very humanitarian sort of point of view. And I think that's the, our answer lies, solidarity, unity, um, and, and support from all decent-minded people in this country.